I'm a researcher at the Australian National University in Canberra. Um, I work on natural resources and agricultural policy more generally. Um, so I teach in the Environmental Management and Development Program at the Crawford School at the ANU. And um, I've done a lot of work here in Indonesia. Um, I guess the most extensive one was I spent a year living in communities on the edge of the forest in Aceh um, some years back. And uh, recently I've had a program, Australian Research Council grant to look at oil palm uh, together with a number of Indonesian colleagues. Uh, well, it might be worth firstly just reflecting a little bit on what the trade-offs are. If you go to uh, communities living near forested areas, they collect non-timber forest products and they also open Sweden areas and they have agricultural um, activities like agroforest which are highly dependent on a range of different activities. They have like a multiple uh, diverse portfolio of activities. Um, so the question I guess is when these landscapes are transformed into um, oil palm, what happens to these people? So that's the first question. We can't assume that they all find a position in the oil palm economy. In fact, in our research we found out that quite a few of them actually fall out. Um, and the second question really is one of, uh, you know, how can these landscapes be used to mitigate um, carb climate change? And that's also quite a difficult question, given that in these contexts, a lot of the people don't really naturally support that agenda because they've got their own needs. And the third kind of question that really emerges, or set of trade-offs, is that when you have these big investors coming into these remote areas with enormous amount of economic resources, how can we really expect weak local governments under a decentralised system to really impose environmental and social criteria that are embedded in Indonesian laws on these plantation investors. So the whole set of problems that pull things in multiple directions. Uh, the moratorium question is an interesting one. I will have to see how it it um, rolls out. It's perhaps a little bit earlier at the moment, but I guess one of the problems in Indonesia is that there are very large land banks. These big plantations, depending on the figures, uh, have got between eight and some people say 16 million hectares of land under different sorts of permits. Um, now, my understanding is that most of these permits have been already granted, so it's very difficult to impose a moratorium on, on those ones. So uh, the question, you know, is I guess from an from a environmental and a social angle, it's, it's really a question of whether Indonesia wants to put so much of its land into these large plantation developments and to what degree it wants to balance the need for economic development with all kinds of other social and environmental criteria. And um, I think there's a body of knowledge now emerging that suggesting that for all sorts of reasons, like I, I mentioned just earlier, we really need to think about a more balanced approach to managing these issues. And it's not clear how the moratorium is actually going to change the fact that all these big investors have always already got such huge areas of land under different permits. Well, obviously I think it would be an understatement to say it's going to be um, pretty challenging, let me just say that. Uh, um, but given that there are so many different actors and agendas and different parts of the, of the state that work in quite contradictory ways, it's, it's quite challenging for, to get the whole thing to work together in a very cohesive and coherent way. I guess that's a challenge for the government to try and have an integrated approach um, rather than a very fragmented approach. You know, and we have to t be realistic, Indonesia is an incredibly diverse country with all sorts of different actors and different landscapes and different um, developmental problems. There are really clear issues to do with creating the right scenarios, of, of creating um, a framework for taking things in a, a way that balances all the different interests and the different agendas of different people while maintaining these very diverse landscapes. Now, um, we could talk about the technical issues of developing a framework that 
might deal with this. But in a lot of ways, Indonesia already has a lot of frameworks around spatial planning and strategic planning, uh, uh, which would help think about the different scenarios and the different trade-offs. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said about how those frameworks w could be improved, uh, but I think that the ones that are already in place are quite good. So it's not really a technical question, I don't think, of getting these frameworks in place. But So we can't really come al uh, along with a new blueprint of how things might work be better, but it's really the political question, really, of how to marshal all these different actors to work in a cohesive direction. And uh, every country has, has this problem with different powerful actors pulling the agenda in different ways. But it's particularly, uh, it's particularly an issue in Indonesia, given, like I said, the, the quite fragmented kind of uh, political process that tends to happen.